Hey everyone, it's Amanda Radke back for another episode of the Heart of Roll America podcast, the show where we highlight great people doing inspiring things in rural America to make our agriculture communities stronger and more robust. And today's guest uh, is a dear friend of mine that I have had the pleasure of working with on the road as we've uh, done speaking events together. And, and her message really, I think, complements mine and we're very aligned in our in our values, our uh, love of faith and family and freedom and and agriculture and, and entrepreneurship and just all the things that we focus on on this show. And so as we kick off 2024 and get rolling with new guests and new content, I'm really pleased to welcome Callie Thorne to the show. So thanks for coming on. Hey, Amanda. Thanks for having me. So I feel like there's so many different topics we could dive into because you are a wealth of information in a lot of different topics. Um, you are a coach, a consultant, a speaker. Uh, you focus on mental health and business and leadership and family dynamics and the cattle business and all of the things. Uh, so I guess maybe dealer's choice. What do you want to dive into first? Because, because I, what's on your mind today? How about that? Yeah. That's why I laugh because when you first reached out, I was like, okay, but give me a heads up. What are we going to talk about? Because sometimes people want this topic or that topic and, and it can, it can really vary. There's, I think like, like a lot of people in the industry, we've got multiple enterprises that we're trying to run when we're entrepreneurs and there's just a lot of life going on. But I, I mean, one thing I always tell CJ though, and you're probably the, very much so the same is there's so many opportunities out there, but, but I think the more and more I look, not everybody thinks that way, right? A lot of that is perspective and mindset and how right. that plays in. And it's like, I just think there's a wealth of opportunities out there and, and I'm, I'm jumping on a lot of them as a business owner. Yeah, it, your hard work ethic and your your vision, you and your husband, to see those opportunities that exist in agriculture and in particular the beef industry. It's like when I hear negative people talk about how they can't make a go of it. I mean, you're one of those families that come to mind is like, well, no, actually there are people that are doing really well and doing exciting things. So maybe let's kick things off. Just tell me about your family and what you guys do up in North Dakota. Yeah. So we farm and ranch up in Northwest North Dakota. Whenever I tell people where we are, I usually say we're about an hour from Montana and a couple hours from Canada. So we are way up there in the corner where it gets nice and chilly. Uh, but we farm and ranch. Uh, I'm the fourth generation. My kids are fifth generation here in McKenzie County. And I, I always joke, we live in my grandma and grandpa's house. It was their place originally. And then I grew up in this house and now we're raising our kids here. So we've got multi-generations here on the operation. We're typically cow calf, but then in the last few years, we've also added a backgrounding feedlot, uh, run some yearlings. We started selling beef um, a lot more in 2020 once COVID hit. But I think we're always, like you said, CJ and I have always had that mindset of we pivot to what has to make things work, right? If maybe there's, we've been cow calf for multiple generations, but that sometimes has your hands tied, right? If the markets aren't right or this or that. So it's like, what else can we add? What can we take away? What do we maybe need to change to make sure we're running it like a true business so that the numbers are adding up? And I, I think that's what I really value about your message. Uh, we had the opportunity to speak together at a National Hereford Women event this fall, which we had never really worked together. Just we've always connected on social media, and and but I knew I knew we were very aligned in that way. But it was almost like we'd been on the road forever. Like it was just yeah, we're a team, and it's great. And so I that's one of my favorite memories of of 2023 was getting to work with you. But let's talk maybe a little bit about that business mindset that you have and. and maybe the message that you shared with the Hereford women or other audiences that you have, maybe some tidbits or, or uh, pieces of advice that you've picked up along the way or that you'd like to share with the audience today. Right. I think probably one of the biggest things that's made a huge impact on my, not just my life, but our businesses as well is, is coaching. So I've done some training, different certifications in coaching. And I've realized I actually went one time to a coaching training thinking um, it was going to help my business and my team that I had at that time. But the ironic thing is I walked away and I'm like, I can, I can be a much better mom. I can be a much better wife. And like how eye opening it was when you see different perspectives. And I think that's sometimes something that we're missing, especially in agriculture, because we can be so used to right? the joke is, well, this is how dad did it. This is how grandpa did it. And it's like, but if it's not working, 
why are we still doing it? Like, why don't we open up to another idea? And I think sometimes though, that's hard. And I, and that's why I enjoy coaching so much is because it's not me hopping on and telling someone, well, this is what you should do because this is what CJ and I did. And it worked for us because that's not necessarily going to be the case for you. So instead it's okay, let's talk about the current situation. What's the circumstance you're in right now? Because a lot of times people will confuse circumstances for thoughts. Yep. We believe that like we're stuck in this situation and that it has to be true, right? I can remember, now I always mess my years up. Was it 2020? I think we were in, nope, it was 21, I think. We were in one of the worst droughts on record. And I've given this example sometimes too for people. Worst drought on record up in North Dakota in McKenzie County. So what is everybody's perspective, right? What are their leading thoughts? The leading thoughts are, this is awful. This is gonna break us. We're gonna have to sell the herd. I'm going to be the one to lose this multi-generational operation. Our hands are tied. It's just our brain literally tries to keep us alive. And it does that by seeking like the worst things that could happen. It's like, well, don't do that. Don't step out outside your comfort zone. Don't jump out of a plane because you might die, right? Like all these things, our brain is like, I'm just going to keep you alive and safe. Yep. But what we have to do is overcome that, like to be able to step outside your comfort zone and try new things. I have to try to think new thoughts. So I, I've actually worked with people on different models and circumstances. That example, I mean, if I'm worried about the drought and that we might lose it all, odds are I'm going to feel overwhelmed. I'm going to feel anxious. I'm not going to be proactive and trying to find things that might help us on our operation. And come the end of the year, it's probably not going to be a very good year for us versus I can think there has to be opportunity in this, right? Mm -hmm. There's got to be something that I am missing, something we can do differently this year because it is such a bad drought. That might mean have to, having to sell a lot of cows, for example, but then maybe things change in the fall. Maybe when the rain comes, we have different ideas of how we can pivot. If I'm more opportunistic or I think there has to be a way to get through this year, I'm going to have more conversations. I'm going to attend some conferences. I'm going to have more positive conversations with neighbors or other people. And your outlook is just different then. Your results end up being differently as well. Well, I look at it from maybe the metaphor of if you have a wild heifer in the pen, it can make it's like contagious. It can kind of spook up everybody. Mm -hmm. And so I think about social media. And if I go on Twitter or X now, and I listen to the farmers and ranchers talk, it really trends towards negativity and like, everything's bad. The markets are crashing. We're in trouble. It's doomsday all the time. And I think about like how that's kind of a contagious mentality. Like if I start thinking it's all going south, there's no options, there's no pathway forward. I will have that mentality and that's how I will approach business. But then now my mindset is kind of like everybody's freaking out and going this direction. It's time for me to walk towards the fire and see what's going on and ask myself, can I provide a solution here? Can mm -hmm. I be a part of changing the course of direction? And is there profitability when I do those things mm -hmm. while everybody else is trending somewhere else? And I, I, I think that mentality, that mindset shift is so important but how would you tell people to have that confidence to try the new business, do the direct to consumer marketing, uh, you know, pivot in the beef business uh, that takes people would say, well, it, you can take risks if you have money, you know, or I could take risks if I know that there's uh, uh, something to catch me if I fall. But mm -hmm. how, how would you give people confidence to just go forward and 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 not have that uh, pessimistic attitude? Mm -hmm. I will say what you focus on grows. I mean, everybody's probably heard that though, too. Like what I'm focusing on, what I'm listening to, what I'm watching, it expands. Mm -hmm. And we all know that. I mean, everybody's probably heard you become like the five people you spend the most time with. I mean, the research shows literally your salaries begin to match. You start to dress the same, talk the same. And so just being aware, who am I spending that time with and stuff. But I think the thing that people have to realize too, is like, these are skills and habits. Um, when I look at both you and I and our businesses and what we've done and what we've achieved, what we've created, if you would have put me here, I never would have thought like, wow, I've actually done some pretty cool things, some fun yeah. things in life and mm -hmm. made some impacts and stuff. But I think people are too focused on, I want it right now, right? Look at all the things that we get fed right away. I mean, whether that's scrolling on social media, the yep. things just like hitting our endorphins and getting us going and stuff. Um, versus Amazon, are we getting our packages fast enough and all those things? So people think 
if one thing didn't go right, or a couple people said no, that, oh, it wasn't for me mm-hmm. versus put in that time and effort. We we're just talking about it earlier, right? The tortoise and the hare, yeah. put that tortoise in life, because I think they always win. They're willing to step outside their comfort zone. And the way you do that is by just practicing it. Mm-hmm. Take one step. It doesn't have to be the whole giant leap, but taking one step. What's that one thing maybe we could look at changing? Um, I, I don't know if you know this, but I run a 90 miles in 90 days challenge with people. Oh, I've noticed. You noticed <laughs> I haven't hopped in though. Yeah, I noticed you didn't join. Um, <laughs> um, but the, that, the whole challenge, right? It's one mile every mm-hmm. single day. And it's like, oh, well, that's not too tough. Like I can do a mile. But then it's like, wait, can I do it every day? Right? Can I really step outside my comfort zone in the days I don't feel like it when I don't think that I want to do something that's hard, or maybe I'm tired, or I'm sick, or I have a busy travel day. And it's like, no, this is a no excuses. Look what you can achieve. Because I think people sometimes get in it for like the physical benefits, right? It's good to get your body moving. But I think people are even more shocked at the end when they haven't skipped a single day. And they're like, oh, wow, like I just did that for 90 days in a row, even on days I didn't want to and days it was hard and challenging. Like it rewires your brain to right. what is actually possible. And so I think it just becomes a practice. Let me try something little that's new and different today. And pretty soon it's like, OK, let me let me see what what might happen in this business or if I try something a little bit differently and I'm I'm always a big person that it's like you don't fail but you can learn right yep. how did I learn from that it maybe didn't go the way that I wanted it to but let me pivot what did I learn from it and I just I think there's so many people with so much talent built up in them and, and ideas but they're too afraid to actually step out there and try it well, and I like that concept of try, of teaching like a disciplined mindset, because if you can create one habit, then yeah. it's like, okay, I, I have that habit. Now I could add something else. And I, I think, you know, we're in the third week of January when this is going to air and a large percentage of Americans set resolutions. And by now they've already dropped those resolutions because I think they see the lofty goal at the end of what they want to achieve. And it feels so far away and so insurmountable. And the second you miss out on one of the 90 days of running, it's like, well, I might as well not finish the last 60. So what do you tell people as they're trying to develop these habits of like discipline and routine and, you know, making excellent habits that will contribute to getting to that end goal long term? But when they when they kind of fall on their face, how how do you kind of navigate through that? I think the hard thing is, is people think it's all willpower. You know what I mean? Like, oh, she's just so motivated or she's got it all together. Right. Or um, you just have more motivation or more willpower than I do. And I think what people don't like today in the world is they don't like to feel uncomfortable. Yes. Right. Right. And it's like, if you don't have that bigger picture, that bigger vision or why, why do I want to start a new business? Why do I want to try my hand at that or do the 90 miles or whatever it might be? Like, do you actually have reason you want to, not because the world's telling you that you should, right. Or that it would be good for you, but why do you actually want to do that? And I think that's what makes the biggest difference is When you understand that, that I guess I always tell people life is 50, 50, right? It's going to be 50% good and fun and great. And things are going our way. And then the other half is going to be hard and challenging. And we're kind of at a place where we don't like that. We don't, we don't know what to do when life is hard. Mm -hmm. So I always uh, tell my clients, like, what do you buffer with? Like, think about it when something's hard or you just feel overwhelmed or there's too much going on. Some people grab the bag of chocolate chips or they scroll on social media because we just can't sit with our own emotions anymore, which as woo -woo as that sounds and stuff, people just aren't willing to feel hard anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we have to be able to do and recognize like this is just life. At least 50 percent of my life is going to be hard and challenging. And so if I can't sit in this. I'm going to turn to something else. I'm going to give up too easily. I'm going to pivot paths because, oh, this must not be for me. Mm-hmm. And I actually, I was at a mental health conference recently too. And I, I asked one of the lead gals, I said, what do you think is missing right now? Why is, why, why are some people leaders and they seem like they're doing so much and achieving so much in their life. And then some people they're heading down a different road. They're mm-hmm. struggling with mental health of one way or another. And she said that kids and adults no longer know how to cope. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to cope with the hard things in life. And so I think about that often with my kids. I've got a 12-year-old, 10-year-old, and a 6-year-old. And it's like, okay, am I I teaching them that hard is okay? 
Mm -hmm. You know, and they've, I think I, I realize them more and more, like, those are some of the best lessons I've taught my kids is when they see me fail at something yep. and then get back up, want to try it again, or want to pivot or still figure it out, not throw my hands in the air and say, oh, well, I guess that wasn't meant for me. Well, talk about your run through the badlands. Now that I'm thinking of it, of like, you you have a specific example in mind of your kids did see you not reach a goal, but then the conversations after of how you handled it is where the real lesson was. Let's Let's talk about that. Yeah. So I had a friend, a so-called friend, I always say, um, <laughs> asked me if I wanted to run an, an ultra marathon. So I've ran some marathons and marathons 26.2. So I've ran those a couple times and, and some less distances, but ultra is anything over a marathon. So there's a race out here in Western North Dakota in the uh, Badlands, of course, of all places. And there's lots of distances we could do, but we were going to do the 56 mile one. And that first year I made it 40 miles and just quit. Um, it was hot to say the least. I remember I specifically, we had a SAG crew. So that's your supporting gear, people that help bring your food. And if you need to change shoes or whatever, whatever you might need help with out there. And I remember specifically, I didn't ask him what the temperature was that day because it was so hot. And didn't if you want to know, know. <laughs> yeah, that's, the, I mean, talk about a mind game, right? If you yep. know anything about the brain, that's all I would have focused on even yep. more was, oh, well, it's X degrees out. And that's why I'm dying out here in the Badlands. Um, but long story short, I, I made it 40 miles. And um, that's actually one of the masterminds that I'm going to run coming up in this first quarter is on the gap in the gain. And so it's all about your mindset of, OK, what could have I said to myself? OK, let's be real. What did I say to myself when I quit at 40 miles? I didn't make it to 56. My brain instantly wanted to say, you know, Callie, you didn't make it. You mm -hmm. quit. You did. You failed. You didn't finish. Mm -hmm. Everybody's watching like all these negative things. And here I made it 40 miles out in the Badlands. <laughs> and so um, there's a book called The Gap and the Gain. It's one of my favorites. I'm going to run a course on it in this quarter where we really instead of looking at how much we missed something by, mm -hmm. we look at how far did we come along in the process? And it's like, mm -hmm. Callie switch that thought that you're having. Have you ever made it 40 miles before? That's the furthest I'd ever ran. And wow. so looking at it more in a positive light and what did I learn? How did I grow along the way? You can apply that to anything in life and business. So tried it again uh, just last year, then in 2023, we we're going to do the 56 miles again. Um, I hit mile 40 and it, that was one, another one of our aid stations. And just in my mind, it was a done deal. Like, you hurt. It's miserable, which, and by the way, it was 110 degrees the year before. Oh my, yeah, you're plus. crazy. <laughs> it was, it was, I understand it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but so then this last year, um, your body hurts. I mean, you're not feeling it's, it's not enjoyable, but it is, you know, yeah. if you understand that. And yeah. We were going, there were some thunder clouds and they said they'll head around you. And so we weren't concerned. We kept going and, um, probably same as South Dakota, North Dakota, we don't get thunderstorms like big ones very often. And it looked like it was going around us. They told us it was going around us. And all of a sudden it started to sprinkle on us. And we're like, oh, that feels good. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, wow, it's really kind of raining and the wind is picking up. And man, that thunder sounds like it's right over us. I mean, all of a sudden it was this storm where if my kids were outside playing, I would have been like, you guys get inside or you're going to get struck by lightning. Right. Uh, but we're out in the middle of the Badlands running. And I can't even tell you, I've never experienced a downpour like that. I can't remember the last time I stood out in the rain when it was pouring. Sure. Um, it was hailing on us. It was wind. There was rain. There was all the things. And we made it 46 miles and we called it quits. Um the worst part of that whole story was I found out that my husband, CJ, and my three kids had driven to Medora. It's about an hour and a half, two hours from us, because I told them it was a done deal and I was finishing. And I knew they'd driven all that way to meet me at the finish line um, and give me hugs and celebrate and stuff. And I felt so bad because it, it, it was dangerous out there at that point. The clay, the buttes, the running cricks now and everything. And we called it quits. And I told them that we wouldn't be finishing. And my kids saw me limping right back to the camper that night and trying to get a shower in and everything. And I just, it's a sickening feeling to not do it. 
on your second attempt, but then knowing your whole family was there to watch you finish and you didn't do that. And I went to bed that night, laid down in the camper, and um, we were doing a little Bible study uh, with a group of women, and that was sitting by my bedside. And I opened it up, and Tylee, my 12-year-old at the time, had written on a bunch of sticky notes there, and it said, Mom, we could not be more proud of you. Oh. And she said, even if you would have done just one mile, we would have been proud of you and stuff. And she's like, you're still incredible. And like, just wrote all these notes to me. And I like, just wanted to sit there and cry because that's what it's about, right? This gap in the gain. Is it recognizing, well, this year you only missed it by 10 miles, right? Or you failed again and all these things, or is it look how far you came. Look, you made it a 46 miles this year and look who was watching though. And I often say that when I'm speaking too, is like you and I have both been on some pretty incredible stages and stuff, mm -hmm. but my biggest stage is these faces that watch me at home. And I always say more is caught than is taught. Yeah. Like they're watching you. They watch how you show up when you succeed. They're watching how you show up when you quote unquote, maybe fail or things just didn't quite turn out the way that we expected them to. Absolutely. And I, I, that's why I think we get along so well too, is just the fact that family is first and like being the mom is the ultimate role in life. And yeah, when you have these little kids watching you, I want, I want them to have, there's that, that inclination to like make your kid's life easy or have the things you didn't have because maybe you could afford it or you could make, you know, make these things that maybe you wish you could have had or experienced when you were a kid. And if you can make it possible I always remind myself, like, life does need to be a little hard for my kids. There, there needs to be struggle that they have to overcome. There needs to be, you know, disappointments. Uh, but I think the ranch is the best setting to teach it because yeah. it's like, look, we're going to go work cattle together. It's going to be hot and dirty and dusty and you're going to get tired and the cattle aren't going to do what we want them to do as we're working them through the chute. But we're doing it together as a family. We're going to get through it. And then there's nothing better. There's no better feeling than at the end of it, you're enjoying a meal together around the dining room table. And it's like, no, nah, we did this job and it, mm -hmm. it was hard, but we well, did. That, that goes back to that mindset, right? It's like hard doesn't mean it's wrong. I think so many people hit hard and it's like, oh, we better stop. Or yep. I don't want my children to face that pain. And it's like, well, that goes back to the whole coping thing. If we don't teach them how to handle hard when it is handed to them, they might make some choices that aren't so good for them. And so hard does not mean wrong. Right. And I think that's maybe the best adv advice we could give in this show is uh, it's easy to choose the path of least resistance where you can just go along and everything's smooth sailing. And but anytime you make a change or try to level up or start a business or do something new or look at the cattle industry and say, hey, I found a new way or I, yeah, I know there's a lot of people doing what I'm doing, but I think I could do it in something unique or I'm me so I can market it different. And there's naysayers in your head and they're telling you all the reasons it's not going to work. And it would just be easier to stay in the status quo. And you mm -hmm. want to get picked on, you want to get criticized and life wouldn't be too hard. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you go for the, the rocky climb, if you choose that path that's really difficult and untraveled, it's like, that's where all the rewards are. That's mm -hmm. where all the excitement is. And like life is, life is too short to just stroll along, I think. Well, and I think you and I are both the same mindset where it's like, I would just always, I mean, that's what they say. The number one regret people have is not living a life that they were meant to live, mm -hmm. right? They just went down to status quo and lived in this regular average life. But it's like, I just, I think I would always be like, I wonder what could have happened if we would have said yes to that opportunity, or if I would have tried that. And I read this quote, I actually have it in front of me that where somebody said the other day, climb the mountain so that you can see the world, not so the world can see you, hmm. right? It's, it's not for me, for you to see me up there or you or all these things, but like, do it for you go climb that mountain so that you can see what's up there and what the world has to offer. I mean, I, you talk about this some, and I've, I've got to talk on it where it's risk versus opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's so many people that see things as, Ooh, that's a risk, or I don't know if you should try that or be careful. You might hurt yourself or you might right. go under. I mean, all the negative things, right? Again, our brain playing into that saying you better be safe versus I might see it as an opportunity. You and I can look at the same exact thing. And I can guarantee somebody says that's going to be risky and somebody else is going to say, 
that could be a huge opportunity though too. So it's all how you want to look at things. And I, I do, I keep stressing to people that takes time and effort though. I mean, it does. If you can have somebody walk alongside you, help give you different perspectives or mindset shifts and realize like, I didn't realize I've had this way of thinking since I was young or right. it's been put into my mind for multiple generations, how we do things or what's going to work, what's not going to work, whether that's finances, relationships, my health, whatever. How, how can I make that switch? Because I'll always ask people, well, how is that serving you? You know, keeping that thought, how's that serving you right now? Or what do you want to change? Why are you choosing to believe that? Well, and it goes back to what you said earlier about surrounding yourself with people that will cheer you on and champion you. I mean, we probably should have recorded the first 45 minutes we talked <laughs> before we hit record because you're a dear friend and we're both entrepreneurial minded and in the cattle business. And you and I were swapping ideas back and forth. And like, I genuinely want you to be truly a success. And I want to be surrounded by people who are cheering me on too and saying like, yeah, you can go do that. And yet I feel like there is, we can get ourselves in circles with people who either think, well, they're insecure because they don't want you to change. Like this is how I knew who you were in high school. You got to stay at that status quo because it makes me comfortable. Mm -hmm. Or they're maybe in that negative mindset where they're just going to try to discourage you because it's bringing up some insecurities they have. And it's like, find the people that will run alongside you, that will cheer you on, that will pick you up when you fall, that will let you bounce ideas off of you, and that will genuinely be excited for you when you reach your personal mountain. I think it's so important to have those people. And if you don't have them, yeah. find them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like find your people and they'll run with you to the to the moon. And yeah. uh, let's talk about your coaching. Let's you, you know, I, I was thinking about just how you said, you asked the question, like, how is this serving you? And I remember being kind of in the hot seat with you down in Texas and you're doing like your little coaching thing on me. And one of the things that people say to, to me all the time is like, how do you do it all? You know, and you're asking me these things like, is this serving you well? Are you okay? And I'm like, well, I don't really sleep a lot. And you know, the diagnosis was I probably need to sleep more. You need to drink more water. And those were our two things. Are you drinking water right now? Yes, that's water in here. Oh, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Did I sleep well last night? No. So <laughs> I'm not doing so good. But you know, you had talked me through it. And one of the things you had said that really stuck with me is you had said, like, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. I'm just gonna ask you. You know, how are these things working in your life? And if it's working, like, it's fine. Maybe it wouldn't work for someone. And that was kind of my answer back at the time was, well, yeah, I just, I'm so excited and I love what I'm doing. Like, I can't imagine slowing down right now. Like, I'm, I'm good, you know, even if I'm tired. It's a good tired. But I guess, what does coaching look like? Like, if someone wants to sign up to coach one-on-one -on -one with you, they have a business question or a family thing they want to work through with you. What does that look like and how do you approach those conversations? Yeah, the nice thing with coaching is, is you guys, they can always reach out if I've got space for whether it's one on one coaching okay. a lot of times and how many weeks I've got a few different packages that they can pick from and stuff. But like when I often run masterminds or um, as you know, I launched an online course last year, it was called Finding You, Discovering It. And along with that or along with this gap and gain mastermind that I'll run, I'll usually add on coaching so they can either do one on one coaching or group coaching, which is really beneficial too because people can come on and it's like I don't know what I want to talk about today but oh we've got Karen over here who seems to have a problem and it's like oh I can apply that coaching to my situation whatever sure. I have going on and a lot of times I'll run clients through what I call the model and it's where we take somebody's circumstance and we walk through like okay are the thoughts that I'm having about this circumstance actually helping me or hurting me and if not how do I want to pivot because I can see how it's impacting my life right? Mm -hmm. I can see how keeping this thought and like recognizing why is it a problem for me that so-and-so treats me this way, right? Or it can be things that people say that bother you or the way that somebody runs the operation or how they make decisions. Uh, coaching is fun because you get a lot of different things. I mean, I've had women who are honestly in corporate offices and want to scale businesses or they're at home with kids or it's families, it's men talking to me about different situations that have come up too. So it's like anything goes in coaching. The tricky thing for me, and this is when you know you found a good coach, but what a good coach does is they ask questions, right? They ask a lot of questions and they help you go from, this is where I am and this is where I wanna go. 
-hmm. They help you realize like, this is the thoughts that I'm having that are holding me back. And if, if I want to stay where I am, then you keep those thoughts. But if you want to begin to change them and it it takes hard work though. I mean, I think people, it's not going to just get handed to you. It's a process, it's a skill where you learn it and stuff. And so it's, how do we take those conversations a little bit deeper and recognize like, okay, why is this happening in my life? How can I fuel it a little bit different? How can maybe my attitude look different? And what can those conversations look like? So we we probably need a part two at some point to talk, really dive into your mental health spe- specialization. But you mentioned talking to men, farmers or people in mm-hmm. agriculture. And let's talk briefly about the mental health work that you do, because uh, we had discussed before the recording, it's really hard to find a counselor, a therapist, or someone that understands agriculture and our identity in the farm and ranch. How do you navigate some of those conversations with individuals or families that are really struggling or going through a hard patch or season and and get them to kind of work through some of those mental health issues they might be experiencing? Yeah, it's always interesting. I shouldn't say it's interesting and it's not surprising, but the number of people that come up and talk to me after I do one of my keynotes, it's on Uh, mental health, breaking the stigma to continue a legacy, because I think that's what people want. But if we're not willing to face some of those hard things or I mean, just the realities of running a business, you know, being in agriculture, having cattle, all the things that we truly can't control, right? Some things like market weather, and it's, it's hard on a person. And when you're the sixth generation and you feel that pressure on you to not lose the whole place, or you have the everyday life struggles that everybody else has too, and it's challenging, Um, you see a lot in agriculture that people don't want to reach out because oftentimes there are very few counselors, therapists that understand this industry like we do. And so you don't want to spend your first four sessions explaining to them like, well, this is agriculture and you may not know where your food comes from, but this is what we do every single day and how it shows up and all the dynamics that play into it. I mean, I think when, if we would sit back, those of us who are in agriculture and sit back and realize like the dynamics that we put up with every single day, not in a bad way, but we are the, we do the work, we do the physical work, we do the mental work, we crunch the numbers, we make some really big decisions. And there's often a lot of, a lot of big dollars that play into that. Um, So I encourage people always do reach out, whether that's to, if it's not to a counselor or therapist, you could find a coach, somebody to have a conversation with, or it could be a neighbor or a friend, um, because the statistics are not good in agriculture when it comes to mental health and even suicide. And so I'm very fortunate that one of the things I'm certified in is mental health first aid. And I often tell people it's kind of like first aid and CPR, which most everybody has taken, right? I've taken it three times in my life. But then I often say, what about mental health first aid? Mm -hmm. And I tell you, when people walk out of that class, I feel so much better as a person because I know they're going out there to make a difference in the world. They will have hard conversations. They will not only improve their life when they're struggling, but they can have an impact on their family or coworkers or people that they run into in town. You'll notice more and you'll know what to do and how to show up in those situations if somebody's having a hard time. Yeah, I, I, I think about in agriculture, it's a unique thing thing. I speak to like bankers conferences where it's like, I want you to understand who these people are, these farmers and ranchers, as they come into your office and ask for a loan, because they're often carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. Meaning, you know, my business is struggling. I'm not, you know, I'm not in the green. I'm not profitable. We might lose this ranch and they're carrying five, six generations of pressure on their backs, a a family Mm -hmm. legacy and a tradition. And, and just the weight that people are carrying around of like, it could end with me. That's Mm -hmm. a ton of pressure. And our identity gets all wrapped up in what that farmer ranch is. And uh, yeah, so I think what we'll do is I will link all of in the show notes information for you for your your mental health courses or training, uh, the individual coaching services you have, the courses that you have available. And of course, you're a speaker, you're on the road speaking as well at agricultural meetings and events. And and so we'll provide people with that information. Um, But is there any with just two minutes left of the program? Is there any final parting words of advice you'd like to share with the listeners as they, you know, kind of set the tone for the year ahead? I think for 2024, I mean, if people could just sit back and recognize that where I choose to put my attention this year, that's what's going to grow, 
right? I mean, where we just went from, if I'm going to be constantly focusing on the negative and what's hard, I can do that too. I know you have that in your life. I have that, but that's not what I choose to put my energy towards. If you can become, if you're not, it takes some time and effort, but you can do it. Become a glass half full person and look for those opportunities. Recognize, become consciously aware where am I maybe not really helping myself? What are some of those negative thoughts that I could begin to work on? And if I need some help, I'll reach out to somebody for it. I love it. Well, I'm sure you guys can tell at the end of this conversation, Kelly and I could go on for a long time talking about a lot of different topics. We didn't even really dive into the beef cattle business, but uh, her and her husband are very dynamic and innovative and working on lots of exciting projects behind the scenes and just kind of showing people the way of, of how you can be profit driven and entrepreneurial minded in agriculture and the beef cattle industry that we love. And so it's exciting. Kelly, you need to come back again very soon, my friend, because there's you're just a wealth of information and a, a true friend that I, I treasure and, and really value in my life. Awesome. Thank you, Amanda. Same goes to you. Yes. Well, this is The Heart of Rural America. I'm Amanda Radke, your host. Thank you for tuning in. If you found value in the show and the conversation, we would sure like to hear from you. Leave a review and be sure to subscribe because new episodes drop every Wednesday. So thank you to Callie Thorne for being on the show today. And we will see you next week for a brand new episode with a new and exciting guest. Take care and God bless.